privacy, data privacy, online, offline, what we like to call data governance for, for close to 20 years. My first job involving that was as the chief of the New York Attorney General's Internet Bureau. And at that time, really online data and privacy policies was, that was just, just beginning. And there was a very big case involving what was then DoubleClick pre-Google and the Abacus Co-op and how they were going to merge. And that really became kind of the seminal uh, set of rules arose out of that that govern online, offline privacy, about merger of databases and privacy policies and what consumers uh, can expect. And over the years, I've done, I've had a number of other positions. I was the general counsel of LiveRamp, which also involved online and offline data. But fundamentally, what we've seen is that every five, six, seven or so years, there's this big sort of uh, data privacy, data governance scare. And there's a set of government rules, often at the federal government level, sometimes at the state level, that come into play. And there's a lot of debate. Often there's a lot of media uproar. There are congressional hearings around it. And very often, so far, the pendulum has, has swung back. And we haven't seen a lot of disruption of the data space. So things feel a little bit different now in that we probably are, a lot of people feel like we are in the next, say, 24 months or so going to get a federal privacy law. And one of the things driving that is all the activity at the state levels. There's a, a lot of bills and laws, in particular the California Consumer Privacy Act, that's driving a lot of concern and, and agita in this space, which is in turn pushing this this, this idea that we need a federal bill to cancel out and what we call preempt the state. So that's that's what I'm going to, to talk about. I'll, I'll talk about a few things on the agenda. I'm going to talk about this, um, basically, what laws exist right now that really are important to the data services uh, industry. California, Vermont, which is a new data broker registry law. GDPR, how many folks in the audience, and it, it may not be all of you, uh, deal with European data or European customers or feel like you've been affected by the GDPR? Um, okay, so so a few of you, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in general. It's, it's, what's that? I said it hurts. It, it hurts, yeah, but, but it's, it's useful because a lot of people in the U.S. are thinking of the GDPR as a model. I'm, I'm going to put this down. You can hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Can, are thinking of the GDPR as a model for U.S. legislation. So it's good to think about the components that may, may hit us here. Um, I'll talk a little bit about, provide an update on what other state legislatures are thinking about in regulating data. Personal information is kind of the term that they usually use. Talk about the federal landscape a little bit, and then generally what you know what what we should be doing to be a little bit proactive and a little bit less real. So, quick refresh: What laws apply to data licensing today? This is all of the laws, but these are sort of the big points that create risk for data services companies. So how, how many folks know what the California Shine the Light was? It's been around for about, about 15 years now. What, uh, what the California Shine the Light law says is that if you're a website and you, are, and you uh, provide, you disclose data to third parties for third party direct marketing purposes. So this might be, let's say, uh, could be like Pine Inc, right? They, could be a, a charity, could be uh, members of a, uh, a data co-op. If you're providing data to third parties, whether those are third party marketing platforms or just selling your list, you have to do one of two things. You either have to have an opt-out option in your privacy policy, where I as a consumer can go to the privacy policy, click on a link, a form, an email, and say, don't sell my data. Or, somewhat, somewhat more difficult, you can respond, provide an option where anybody can write to you, let's say by email, call you, write to you by mail, and say, hey, 
who did you sell my data to in the last calendar month? And then you have to provide a list, a list. So that's a little bit more friction, but, but that's what the California Shine the Light law says. A few years back, there were a bunch of class actions, in particular against, against publishers, media organizations who you know, share their data. It, uh, there was a couple of favorable rulings that said it's, it's not that easy to bring a lawsuit under the Shine the Light law, at least the class action lawsuit. So it's been quiet for the last five years or so. In the fall, there were a bunch of class actions filed. So this may be a place that, um, that we may see more activity. But at the same token, by the same token, this is somewhat being superseded by a much, much worse California law that we're going to talk about in a few slides. So, I'm sorry. Are you going to make it because I'm scribbling furiously? Oh, you can. You, <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, you can. I'll send you these. I think somebody. <laughs> okay, I'm exhausted. <laughs> yeah. No, of course. Of course. Can I just ask a question? Um, I'm familiar with the California Shine Light Law, but in, in the B option, something I don't know is, do you have to do you have to tell a consumer exactly who got access to their record or which marketers you sold records? That's to? a good question. You're allowed to do either. Okay, thank you. You're allowed to do either because because you wouldn't really know. You wouldn't be able to provide them the like 500 you know marketers who who, who got pieces. Their data. So, so yes, that's a good question. You, you, you can if you're selling it, if you're selling the data to a platform, you would just give the, the consumer the, that information. I, I usually tell clients to just provide the opt out because frankly, there's less friction. And if you invite people to write to you and get the lists, this 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 back and forth, and people are annoyed, and people don't understand the law, and they threaten to sue. Whereas if you provide an opt-out, you, you've done your duty. And the fact of the matter is, very, very few people go to a website's privacy policy and opt-out. I've never had a client, even among quite large platforms, who get more than a handful of, of, of opt-out requests. So from California, the largest, most, po most populous state, anyway, to Vermont. Vermont's a tiny state. Counts for about 0.2% of U.S. population, a little bit more than, than, than Boulder, Colorado. Um, their bit, my guess is that their marketing population is even less than that. My guess would be, because it's largely, you know, it's an agricultural state, uh, my guess is that, it, that in terms of the marketing community, it's probably 0.1% would be my, my rough guess. And yet, they are, they have kind of assigned themselves to be leaders in data broker, that's the term used in the, in the statute, data broker regis uh, registration. So how many of you have registered as data brokers in, in Vermont? Okay, a few people, that, there was a list that went out uh, a couple weeks ago, they provided a, a list in Vermont of all the people that had registered. Well, essentially what this, this statute went into effect January 1st. And what Vermont says is that if you are a data broker, it's sort of a conventional definition, you are selling or licensing data that is, is of consumers who you don't have a first party relationship with. So if somebody, uh, presumably, if somebody uh, licenses their own list to somebody else, they don't have to register, they're not a data broker. But if you're uh, a third party intermediary and presumably you take some proprietary interest in the data, you're required to register, or at least so says Vermont. And you have to fill out a form. It's not a terribly well done form. There's some typos in it. Uh, they have the same question appears verbatim twice, which is, which is kind of sloppy. Uh, but they ask you to explain your opt out they ask you whether you have a credentialing process. They don't explain what that means or what, what they, what, you know, they don't ask you to explain what your credentialing is. But they ask yes or no, do you, do you do credentialing? And then they say, have you had any, any data breaches in the last year? That's the part that I don't like. And that, to me, is a reason potentially for companies who don't have to register to not register. Uh, and 
the fact that Vermont is such a tiny state suggests that a lot of companies uh, aren't subject to jurisdiction in Vermont. So you would have jurisdiction in Vermont, let's say if you had a lot of Vermont customers, for instance, you sell a lot of data to, to other entities in Vermont. Just having a list of people in Vermont probably doesn't subject you to jurisdiction in Vermont. Nonetheless, a lot of people are registering just to avoid getting a nasty letter or nasty back and forth with the Attorney General of Vermont. But you should know that this statute uh, is out there. And, and there's more, there's pretty good guidance on the Vermont Secretary of State and Vermont Attorney General page if you want to learn more about that. What other laws apply to data services? Well, we know that state UDAP deceptive practices apply. If you say something in your privacy policy and it's not true, you can get slammed by a state attorney general or, or the FTC. And a number of companies, in fact, have. That's something that often gets um, gets investigated. And it gets investigated under FTC laws, as well as the state the corresponding state deceptive practice law. We know that there are particular laws that govern political data. So data that you get from voter rolls, voter affidavits, voter registration records, which you can often just uh, download directly on the web through APIs. In about 30 states, uh, I think 32, you're only allowed to use that data for political purposes, political campaigns, get out the vote. You couldn't take those lists and let's say uh, use them to uh, for marketers that are, that are trying to sell books, right? The, the new Sarah Palin book, the new Al Gore movie. You can't do that. You can do that in about 18 states, but not in the majority. And, and that's kind of important because in most of those states where you're not allowed to do that with the data, it's actually a, a crime. It's actually a misdemeanor. It's an under-enforced or largely unenforced uh, statute, but, but it, it's an important law, and at some point, it's going to be enforced by somebody who wakes up. Um, <laughs> Is that a, like a question? Fair Credit Reporting Act, people know what this is, probably. Uh, you have to be careful that your data is not used by your clients to evaluate creditworthiness, employment, uh, employment applicability, housing uh, to, to weed people out or in. And this is why I always tell my clients to have, in addition to all the other reps, warranties, limitations, to have a particular block in bold that says you must comply with FICRA and, and and lay that out because there have been some companies that have gotten into trouble for what their clients have done and for not uh, being vigilant enough about the use of their data for prohibited purposes under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Um, scrape data, there's, there's been a lot of scraping of data in the last five or ten years, data that gets scraped off, um, off the web. That data is used for targeting. The data has increasingly been used for fintech financial companies that are monitoring uh, trends uh, with companies. And uh, for a while, that was considered a low to medium risk. I think it's probably a low risk now to use scrape data. And the reason I say that is because the uh, while there has always been a risk that you might get a cease and desist letter and have to, have to dump a bunch of data, now there are even fewer cease and desist letters going out about uh, scrape control data because LinkedIn got sort of reprimanded by a court a year or so ago, maybe a little longer, uh, in California when they sent out cease and desist letters to some companies, including a company called IQ, saying stop scraping our data. And what the court in California, the federal district court, said was, hey, this is public data. And unless you have to uh, get behind a, a password or login or something like that, if it's available to everybody, then you can't really control it and stop sending out these cease and desist letters. LinkedIn took it up on appeal. It was argued in the summer or fall, I think in August. There's, and so we're watching for that decision because, uh, because we want to see if the Ninth Circuit agrees or overturns it and says, no, 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 you have a right to control who has access to your servers and you have a right to enforce your terms of service, and this stuff about private versus public data, we, we don't buy. So that's an interesting 
case that's coming down the pike for anybody that's using licensing, relying on scrape tape. Um, social media data obviously is very much in the news since Cambridge Analytica, and there are increasingly a lot of there's a lot of attention around that in, in Europe. Cambridge Analytica got slammed in Canada as well. So social media data, data that's coming out of the Facebook and other APIs is, is, has been, has really been uh, pulled back uh, to some extent. And increasingly companies have some risk that they didn't have before if they're violating API terms in the way that, you know, it's much bigger and more profound way Cambridge uh, and uh, Analytica was. So that's the really quick synopsis of the laws that exist today. Putting aside GDPR, I'll spend a little bit of time on that, but any questions so far on anything that I've... Yes? Um, if you using tools that are Can you, when you're profiling somebody, say looking for conservatives or something, can you utilize that data or no? It's That's just... a very good question. I've thought about that. The, most of the states, every, every state law is written a little bit differently, but the majority and maybe the significant majority of, of the states that prohibit, that, that prohibit, that have prohibitions around political data say use. They don't say share. They don't say build targeting sets from. They say use. Sometimes they even say access to the news. So uh, yeah, you're not you you you. Like, it's interesting to think about. Could you use this? Could you use uh, data that you get from a voter roll to build out a lookalike set, right? Mm -hmm. And then you pull out the C data. The answer is is that in some fair number of states, you you can't. Now, would anybody catch you? Would anybody care? It's a different question. But interpreting the law strictly, the answer is, is often no. And just a moment, sure. are all states um, political data available, or only some states? I believe, well, no, I, I believe all or nearly all states. I, I want to say 49, but I can't identify the state. What's that? That's what I call it. Um, yeah, so I think in 49 states it's available, but in I think 30, I think the numbers that I gave are correct, that in 32 of them there are strict limits, and in 7, yeah, yeah I mean I, every year or so I, I update my research, and there were, there were a couple of changes, like Illinois changed, but yeah, it's give or take 31, 32, there are, there are, are restrictions. And of the others, 18 or so, a few of them are, are, big, are, are relatively large states uh, that you have unrestricted use of. Mm -hmm. so, but, so theoretically, you could build out a look like set from those. Um, yeah, so mostly what I've read applies to consumer data. What's the application for B2B, or is there anything at all in place for that? Uh, well, B two B is is exempted by some of these uh, by some of these statutes. Um, so I, I think I think the Vermont and B two B is not covered by Shine the Light law. I believe it's exempted by Vermont, uh, but I'm not 100 percent sure. Of that. I, be, I believe that's the case. Uh, the GDPR, which we're going to learn about applies a different standard. So I think it's, I think it's pretty likely, well, well I don't want to predict. It's, it's quite possible that, that when, if we get a new privacy law federally, that B2B will be held to a different standard. The concept around B2B is, it's, uh, you know, it's, you're kind of helping somebody do their job. Yeah. That's the concept under the GDPR. So it's a quote unquote legitimate basis to use the data. It's exempted from, you know, a number, but it's not exempted from some standards. It's not exempted from CAN spam, for instance. So I don't Correct. think that Correct. B2B data uh, is exempted from CAN spam, and you don't need your, your opt out uh, link. I often get emails from, from 
people inviting me to conferences and I don't have the opt-out link. I know, I know that that's a violation. I also know that can spam is a very under under enforced law. You know, it's enforced largely by 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 uh, by ESPs, right? And, and the, because yeah, mostly what I've read relates to home address, so I wasn't sure what this is addressed. Well, that's the difficulty. I mean, you don't really know if something is is a B2B address or, or a home address. Or... So, I won't, I won't belabor GDPR because I know there's a minority of, of folks who, who are particularly interested in this, but here's, here's the backdrop of the big parts to the of the GDPR. The GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, was this big law, 100-page law, that went into effect across Europe. And it went into effect last May. And there had been a two-year runway. So for a long time, there was a lot of preparation and a lot of legal fees and a lot of kind of hand wringing that went into this. And now we've still got some confusion and it's probably going to be three, four, five years before it all works its way through the system. That said, the key pieces to the GDPR across Europe uh, and the key questions are, first of all, to ask whether the GDPR applies. GDPR applies to companies not only if they have uh, actual boots on the ground in Europe, but it applies to companies that are targeting people in Europe, selling services and goods into Europe, uh, monitoring or keeping, the, if you're a website, uh, tracking and monetizing the behavior of Europeans. So for a lot of US only companies, GDPR doesn't apply. But if you're kind of reaching overseas, trying to reach those customers, trying to monetize those consumers, GDPR does apply. So if GDPR does apply, what companies have to ask is, what's my basis for collecting data? So if you, for instance, if you take somebody's name and address and email, and they're your customer, and you're going to provide services to them, or if you're going to market to your own customers, that's considered a quote-unquote legitimate interest. And you don't need consent for that. So how many of you have either in going to Europe or interacting with European websites seen some sort of, uh, it may be a cookie bar or maybe something robu more robust. Okay, so increasingly if you go to, let's say, uh, a, a German newspaper site, you're going to see, because they're covered by GDPR, even if you're not, you're going to see a sort of widgety thing that's going to say some stuff and tell you how they're using your data, and you're going to have to say that that's okay with you. Or, or you'll have the right to tell them not to do certain things with your data. And that's if, if they are going to use your data to monetize it, to sell it, uh, to use it for quote unquote monitoring or online tracking, they've got to get your consent. We don't like that. We think that that puts a lot of friction into the relationship. It's been criticized. There's this concept called consent fatigue because people in Europe are constantly being bombarded by these boxes and widgets and screens, and it's actually super annoying. So, so there's some very legitimate criticism to having to get these, make people jump through these consent hoops. Um, there are significant notice requirements under the GDPR. It's a fair bet that whatever we wind up with in the next year or two or three in the US, that uh, it will, whatever that law is, that there will be some more uh, robust requirements of privacy policies. So, you know, there will be a certain amount of elegance and nuance that's going to go into crafting those, uh, regardless of what happens. Another piece that's important to the GDPR, that's also important to laws in uh, California and bills in places like Washington that are becoming very popular, state of Washington, are access and deletion requests. There's this concept brewing throughout the world that people have a right to know more about how companies are using their data and whether companies have their data. So it's likely that we're going to see that more as a trend, where a consumer has the right 
to call or write or email and to the extent that their identity can be at least generically verified that they are who they say they are, that they will within 30, 45, 60 days, whatever it is, different under different laws, have the right to get uh, like a CSV or some sort of file that says, here's what we know about you. And to, and to opt out of that for certain purposes. For instance, for marketing purposes, you can't opt out for, let's say, billing purposes or legal purposes. But that's a right that they have under the GDPR, and that's, that's sort of a theme that we're seeing in the US. Um, and under the GDPR, there's this concept of controllers and processors. How many people have heard that distinction? Some people are controllers, some, some companies are controllers, some are processors. In the US, we call processors service providers. And we call controllers something else, maybe data owners. But they call it controllers and processors. The, the concept there is that the controller is the entity that's really in charge of the data. They make the decisions about how personal information is used. And the processor is just the company that does what the controller says. Store my data, model my data, um, use my data to send an email, and so on. So that's another distinction that, that increasingly is overtaking the US as something that's important. Uh, so, so far we've seen some, I, I'm not going to belabor this, but there's regulators are still kind of getting their footing each country in Europe has a different regulator. They all have different priorities. In France, the regulators have focused on location, uh, location networks, people, co uh, companies that are aggregating mobile data, in particular mobile location data. Uh, in, in other countries, they, they focus on other things. We're starting to see the first complaints. And uh, so far, the fines have been fairly low. But, and, and frankly, a lot of the regulators are still trying to figure out what their priorities are going to be. So this is kind of what happened <laughs> on May 26, which was the day after uh, the day after GDPR passed, and companies started getting in all these data access requests from from people saying, "What what what do you know about me?" And that's kind of how all of us lawyers felt. And that's what we're trying to avoid in California. So, so with that, uh, that's going to be our segue into talking about the California, the California Privacy uh, Protection Act. Yes. Does this apply only to European community countries? It it applies it applies only to European Union countries, but EEC countries like in Scandinavia, most of them have similar or analogous uh, requirements. So, Any idea what happens to Britain in three weeks? <laughs> well, they would, have to, they would have to pass something that says that they still have their national laws. And a lot of their national laws, like for instance for email marketing, largely parallel what, what the GDPR has. But to fill in the gaps, they probably do need to pass uh, a, a gap fill, some gap filling measures. But it doesn't apply until we do so. Correct. Yes? Any idea of the uh, economic impacts of GDPR and how that's impacted jobs or anything along those lines yet? Well, I mean, no, I don't, I don't, I haven't seen any anything and I think it's hard to gauge. I, one, I mean, one thing that's been criticized is it's, it's, it's so complicated and it's so burdensome and now with potential fines it's so risky that it's, you know, a lot of people feel that it's led to a, uh, to a concentration of the market. I mean, I've got a number of clients who, who have pulled out of Europe and just said it's, it's, it's not worth it. We're going to focus on on APAC, we're going to focus on, on uh, uh, you know, U.S., maybe they're, if they're they will internationally, maybe they're focusing on Brazil or South America, maybe even Mexico. But um, so, so there's somewhat less competition. There's somewhat less data. There's a lot more annoyance. Uh, 
and uh, the lawyers did very well. <laughs> we had, our firm had a, a banner year. Um, it was, it's not necessarily the way you want to make, you make money because it's, it's opt out of you selling their data. On the other hand, what businesses are allowed to do is to provide discounts or, and incentives to people who allow them to sell the data. So that's really angels dancing on the head of a pin, and that's one of the things that people have asked the Attorney General to. Uh, to explain and, and, and hopefully to, to clarify. Personal information under the CCPA is a very broad definition. So it's all the stuff we've conventionally thought of as personal information, name, address, email address, cert, uh, a hashed, you know, de-identified uh, email address is probably personal information. A unique ID is, biometric information is, an IP address is. There's ways you can, can theoretically de-identify data, but if it's a unique identifier that can be tied to you or to your device, it's personal information. And again, there's some bad drafting in here because the way that they they draft it, they say any personal information is anything that uh, can identify you or that's related to anything. <coughs> that can identify. So like your your hat is personal information, anything that's related to you. So I don't think that's what they mean, but that's how broadly it's written. So one of the central points that everybody has to figure out, at least everybody that's holding the data of, of California, California residents, is do you sell data? So the definition of selling data under the CCPA is to disclose data to somebody else in exchange for money or other valuable consideration. What a lot of people who supported the law and a lot of privacy advocates and a lot of legislators say is that, is that, that should, that's intended to be a very broad test. So what a lot of people say, and I disagree with this, they would say that if you have a co-op, let's say, an online co-op, right, where you're maybe you're working with a company like AdRoll or Pritio, and you know they're collecting data from your from your site and they're retargeting an ad for you, but they're also learning about the browsers that go to your site, and everybody gets something out of the deal, and and that's a, a co-op uh, model, or or you could be a, an offline co-op, or you could be some some combination of both of them. Uh, a lot of people would say, well, that's a sale because it's sort of a cost of entry. You have to allow this third party to use your data in order to get the valuable service that they're providing. To me, that's completely upside down. Uh, you can see me debating it on the, the ramp up website with, uh, with, uh, with a friend of mine who's, who's a privacy activist. But I mean, to me, that's upside down. If you're not getting money, you're not selling anything. If, if you're a business and you're a member of a co-op, and you're paying the co-op $10,000 a month uh, for access, subscription, whatever it is, and you're also allowing them to use your data to, to create a product, it seems to me if I was that business, I would say, what are you talking about? I'm selling it. I'm, not, I'm paying $10,000 for a subscription. How can I possibly be selling my data? So, but, but that's an issue that people are disagreeing about. And in, in other state statutes that are being uh, drafted in this model, they're, they're corrected for it. But, but right now it's a little bit up in the air in California, and I frankly, I, I don't understand how so many people are taking what I think is an extremely broad definition of the term sale. Uh, in any event, uh, so, so then, there, so there's, on the one hand, you could be selling data, and there's also some definitions in the statute that says selling is for a commercial purpose. There's this other definition in the statute that says there's this other thing called a business purpose. And what they obviously have in mind for business purpose is, is service provider functions. When you give your data to somebody and you say, hey, deliver this mail to somebody, or hey, store my data, um, or, or hey, do security functions on, around my data. In CCPA, under CCPA, if you're only disclosing the data for a business purpose, it's not a sale. And 
here's the interesting thing. A disclosing data for a business purpose includes giving data to your service provider so that your service provider can perform your operational purpose or perform your service provider's operational purpose. So now you're getting some circular <laughs> stuff going on. If I give if my service provider, if the, their purpose is to run a data platform or a retargeting platform or to create marketing segments or lookalike segments out of my data and everybody else, then that's, that's their operational purpose. That's why they exist. So what the law says is this. They say, well, okay, but if it can't be a, they, what they can't do, if they further sell, if your service provider further sells it, it's not a business purpose anymore. Then it's a sale. So why does any of this matter, by the way? Why does it matter whether something is a sale or a commercial purpose or a business purpose? The reason it matters, the reason it matters is because, no, oh, it's, it's right here, is because if you sell data, whether you're an intermediary or a website or a retailer, you have to post this sort of ugly scarlet lettery thing on your website that says, do not sell my personal information. And it's got to be a link. So if I'm Macy's and I'm providing data to whomever and I'm letting somebody else do stuff with my data, or maybe I'm selling it, maybe I'm getting a rev share, maybe I'm putting it on the exchange. But I've decided that I'm selling it. I've got to now provide this link on my landing page. And I've got to make sure that anybody that I'm selling it to has an opt-out on that page. In other words, that my uh, consumers, my customers who are giving me their data, whose data I'm selling, can opt-out. They have to be able to opt-out of the sale. So maybe they can opt-out through me. Maybe they have to go to third-party websites. Maybe if it's online data or cookie data, they have to go to the DAA website. Maybe there's something else. Maybe they have to input their email address if they're working with a, a hash email platform. So that's annoying and it's kind of ugly. And it's also a little bit non-intuitive because if you're, you know, if you're if you're only, for instance, getting a rev share from a cookie audience, it's not intuitive to you that, that that's selling personal information. But because personal information includes anonymous cookie data under this law, that's what you're doing. So there's going to be a lot of strategy by the companies that are in direct contact with the consumer, whether that's web publishers or retailers or someone else, uh, media platforms, to try to define what they do around uh, not being a sale. And for that matter, st strategically, companies may be in a better spot. Service providers may be in a better place if they are not further selling the data. Because then they can say, well, I'm only using the data for an operational purpose, so I'm really a service provider. I'm not, giving it to me is not selling it because I am keeping it internally within my own four walls. So, what about the exemptions? There was a lot of discussion in California about, about this law being kind to small businesses. So, businesses are exempt from the CCPA if their gross revenue is under 25 million. That's gross revenue. So, not net. Uh, and you don't buy or sell personal information of 50,000 or more Californians. Excuse me, is that 25 million California? Based well, they, it's a good question. They didn't, they didn't <laughs> specify. So I think most people think it's 25 million overall, or, or they would have said 25 million in California. Well, they need to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, they, they do specify California in the next uh, qualifications. So. Unless they say otherwise, it's fair to assume that's a global figure. Yeah. 
Uh, and if, if you get more than 50% of your annual revenue, even if that revenue is a million dollars, from actually selling consumers' personal information, you're, you're covered. So they're trying to cover what they think of as data services companies, data brokers. I'll, I'm going to make all of this available afterwards. You don't feel you need to copy it down unless you want to. <laughs> Uh, in fact, who has a copy? You, uh, yeah, no, we're going to send it out. Right? Yeah, so, so um, here's the other piece that's that's super annoying. A third party. So a third party is a company that's not the business. You're not in direct contact with the consumer. And you're not the service provider. You're a third party. You're what we would think of as a, I guess, a buyer of data, or downstream licensee True. of data. Uh, cannot sell personal information about a consumer that has been sold to you, so you can't intermediate data, unless the consumer has received explicit notice about that and an opportunity to exercise the right to opt out. So this part is hard. Because this means that if you're getting data from someone that's getting data from someone that's getting data from someone, that someone X has to have said, hey, here's how you opt out of, of company Z that's going to be modeling and, and reselling or relicensing your data. This is the part that cries out for an industry solution, for an industry page, because otherwise, Otherwise, there's no, no practical way to make this work unless the legislature loosens up on this and says it doesn't really have to be explicit notice. It could just be a page somewhere that someone has access to. Uh, or if, um, I mean, that, yeah, that would basically be the solution um, if, they, if they get rid of this. Otherwise, <laughs> what's that? Just get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, well, we could cross it out here, but, but it's not going to. It's not going to. It's still going to exist on the state books. But um, but I mean, the danger here is that some companies that are feeding data into the ecosystem are going to say, I, I, I'm not taking on the liability for these downstream companies. And I'm not going to try to figure out how to make sure that the consumer can opt out of them. And sure, I'm getting incremental revenue here, and I, I like that. I'm happy about that. But I don't want to deal with the liability. Now, so a big question here is how much liability they're going to have. And, and I'm going to get into that in a moment. Well, well, I'll get into it now. So there's not much. I'm really on this slide, but, but, but the point is, right now, it's only the Attorney General that has enforcement power. So the good news about that is that the Attorney General can't go after everybody. They're just a state office and they have bigger fish to fry. Uh, they've been very upset about being burdened as the sole enforcer of this really terrible and you know, incoherent law. So. Uh, so that's, that's kind of good, because one would assume that they're only going to go after large companies, and, or if they do something that's more of a sweep, they wouldn't, you know, they're not going to get in, they're not going to dig in and fight, right? The, the problem, though, is that two weeks ago, this, uh, you know, the AG was coming out against this act, they, they said it's, it's badly written. Everybody said, "Yay!" They said, you know, we, it's not. We don't want to be the enforcement official. That's great. They said, "So, so we want there to be a private right of action where you can bring class action." And that, and then everybody's, you know, reaction was, "You know, who asked you?" <laughs> <laughs> that kind of help we don't need. So we're hoping now to stave off a private right of action because if you've got a private right of action with a very broadly defined statute that's, you know, with this sort of inconsistent, incoherent set of responsibilities, and on top of that, this set of very impractical responsibilities where, where you know, you've got to have 
provided the user an opportunity to opt out more or less at the time that it's created, assuming that's the way we interpret that, it, it becomes very impractical. There's a lot, of, lot less data flowing into the system, at least from California. Uh, the other alternative, by the way, is to have notice boxes for people in California. That would probably, because of the way this, this thing can be interpreted, uh, be, be fulfilling a request uh, by the consumer. The consumer said, give me access to this website and you can use my data and we don't care. Arguably the consumer can waive some of this, but nobody wants to do that either. So, so to recap, under the California Privacy Act, a Consumer Privacy Act, the questions to be asking are, who is selling the data? Is data being sold, first of all? Or is there some, some argument that, that you, for instance, are really just a service provider and you are just fulfilling an operational purpose? Who is selling it? And is it being sold downstream or is it being kept somehow internally? end-to-end -end platforms are going to have advantages here. Uh, and then contractually, how much leverage do you have? There's going to be a lot of fight the way there was and still is in Europe over uh, you know, sort of battle of the forms because third parties are going to be pushing liabilities and indemnities and obligations onto the parties that are closest to the consumer and parties closest to the consumer are not going to want to take on those liabilities. They're going to want to say, look, I don't think I'm selling data, but I don't really know. So if I get slammed and you get slammed, you know, all, 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 we're, all, we're each in it on our own and we're not going to indemnify each other. So there's going to be a lot of that legal back and forth about who is responsible for for making sure that the law gets uh, properly interpreted and applied and you know who's, who's going to be on the hook. Um, and there may be an industry solution. I mean, again, this cries out for an industry solution, a seamless page where everybody that you know, works with data can, um, can provide an opt-out. I, I, I'm on the board of the NAI, which is really the, 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 the online third party trade organization, all the people like, you know, MediaMap and Google and LiveRamp and folks like that. And, um, and, and we're rolling out a, a PII-based opt-out system. So you could imagine something like that, where people can opt out through an email, and anything that's connected to their email gets opted out of a database, gets, you know, sent out, could be to, you know, a thousand different companies, and it's this sort of streamlined, uh, concentrated opt-out. But, I mean, that's not happening tomorrow, so. But, I mean, that is one of the things that the Attorney General is supposed to comment on and start thinking about. There's also a particular, just, just in case that wasn't all enough, <laughs> there's also, under the CCPA, an affirmative opt-in consent requirement for the collection of personal information from kids under 16. So, a child is allowed to consent, but has to consent, to the sale of, it, of his or her information if that child is 13 to 16. Under that, as a cop of federal law, the parent has to consent. Did they, did they ask parents about that before they? Yeah. Yeah, it's a little odd. It's a little yeah, odd. Yeah, yeah. And, well, and then this week I read there's a federal bill, like, I think it was just today or yesterday, where and I haven't read the bill, I don't think it's been made public yet, but there's apparently this federal bill that's going to come out that's going to essentially raise COPPA, folks know what COPPA is, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, to 15. Which actually is, is more complicated yeah. than it sounds like, because you don't, there, there's, the thing about COPPA is that most of the decisioning is about whether a particular property, an app, a game, a website, is directed to children. Now it's pretty easy to know whether an app is directed to a child under 13, right? right? right. I mean, at 13, like my kids are 13 and they're reading a lot of the stuff that I read. Right. Uh, right. But, but at 10, you know, 9, 10, 11, it's, 
seven, eight, if it's a Dora the Explorer app, or a kid's coloring, or you know, math for kids website, you kind of know that's for kids. But 14, 15, there's a lot of content, music content, social content, gossipy stuff that eh, it gets kind of hard to make the decision, especially if you're getting buying data from that website. How, how do you know if what the demographic of the website is? Very difficult. So I don't. It, it sounds easy to say, well, 13, 14, 15. What's the difference? But it's actually hard because these are content-based. These are statutes that ask you to evaluate content. So will the California legislature fix this mess? Assuming I've convinced you that it's a mess. Um, the answer is maybe. There are a lot of bills that are pending, put in by industry organizations, by the California Chamber of Commerce. Uh, they're trying to, for instance, from right now, employees are technically covered by this. So technically, an, em an employee can go to her employer and say, hey, I want to see every, all the information you have, any confidential you know, job reviews, performance reviews, anything you have, give it to me. So they want to change that. Uh, a bunch of industry groups want to narrow the scope of personal information and take out stuff like cookie IDs and IP addresses and unique identifiers that are not, you know, contact information. A lot of people are skeptical that that'll go through. The ANA and its sister organizations has a particularly aggressive approach. They want to remove online advertising, use of data for online advertising from the definition of sale, which is, you know, it's kind of a steep climb because really the, the entire, like the main reason that this was passed was because of the collection of data for third party purposes online. Um, and they, they want to, there's, there's other bills to clarify some of the other definition problems that I, that I mentioned uh, before. California Attorney General, again, probably won't help. The California Attorney General said, we're going to do as little as we possibly can. We're only going to provide interpretation and guidance of the things that the statute specifically says we have to do. And by the way, we need 24 more people because we don't have enough staff here. So there's a bill, I think it may have passed now, to give the AG more staffing. But the AG's main proposal has been to say, please don't put this all on our lap. Let people sue. And if that... You know, we'll see how that, we'll see what happens with that. Um, so, how many people have, have followed what's going on on the national level with potential national privacy legislation? Okay. I'm sorry. I'm really into this topic. So a minority of people, but a very, very distinguished minority of people, have... Um, there are... This is probably, as of this week, outdated. But there, there have been five or six proposals federally. Uh, a couple of them are just rehashes of, uh, of bills that have been around for a while. None of them, frankly, I've read all of them, and none of them are terribly impressive. They're either extremely broad or the definitions are extremely mushy, like they're not allowed to use data in objectionable ways. Um, or they, like the Rubio bill is maybe the best of them, but it largely defers nearly all of the definitions and obligations to the FTC. And they say the FTC should, should sort this out. Um, so we're still waiting for that really decent, balanced federal bill to come along. And, and the thing about, the, the, the main thing that we want to see in the federal legislation is that it preempts state legislation. That it preempts state legislation that governs the collection and commercialization of, of data. Because if it doesn't preempt state, state laws, there, there, there's really no point. This is sort of what happened. How many, how many folks go back to, to re remember can spam, I do. Uh, so remember what happened with can spam, everybody was worried about, about email marketing. And consumer groups were calling for, uh, for, for, for legislation, nobody knew exactly how that would work. And then California developed this, I think it was SB1 it was called, the Senate bill that 
that actually went into effect briefly that, that was essentially an opt-in bill. They said you cannot market to people, even your own customers, unless they opt in and say, yes, you can send me emails. That got, got Congress moving pretty quickly. We got this much better, relatively streamlined, relatively intuitive act called CAN-SPAM. And the hope is that we would have something similar federally, maybe that, that punches up privacy policies, maybe that provides a right of access so long as the person can be uh, you know, verified, because you don't want to be providing personal information to somebody that's a stalker or that hasn't proven that they're the person to whom the data pertains. Um, maybe some particular protections around sensitive data, whatever we consider to be sensitive, and, uh, and, and you know, deletion rights. And hopefully not a, not much more than that, hopefully not a private right of action, hopefully not these ugly and annoying consent bars and requirements, but, uh, but we're, we're going to keep seeing activity uh, on the federal front, probably on a weekly basis, and some of the some of the, the bills that are out there are probably going to keep getting homed and improved. That's the hope, anyway. Okay. Uh, what makes it what makes it hard right now, in terms of the timing, is you've got this California bill that's going to take effect mid next year. We've got this year, which is 2019, to get the, uh, the federal bill right. Next year is an election year. People tend to think not much gets done in election years. And if it doesn't get done this year or next year, then you're into 2021, at which point California and potentially other similar state bills that are really restrictive, that potentially hurt the industry, narrow data flow, cause potentially lawsuits to be filed, are, are now on the book. So we want to, so this is sort of important. Somebody had a question. Ken, you had a question? Yeah, what industries are driving the federal uh, legislation or push for against preemption or non-preemption? Is there particular industry segments? That well, I think it's a combination. It's, I mean, certainly big tech right now is pushing for a federal bill. Amazon, Google, Facebook have all, you know, in the Internet Association, it comes like eBay and so on, have all been very active. I, I think the, the retailers have also been, been pushing for it. They want access to data, as does the, the ANA, the, um, the, the Advertising Association. So I think, I think all, of those, all of those associations have, 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 have been pushing. I think, I mean, big tech has maybe been pushing the hardest, but... Uh, How about banking? Anything in banking pushing? Mm. I mean, to the extent that they're members of the ANA, I, I would say yes. You know, they are big advertisers. <clears throat> so, um, so what are other states doing? I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but Wash the Washington State Privacy Act is a significant bill. It just, it, uh, March 6th, uh, passed the Senate, so it goes to the House, and, and, and it's probably got a pretty good chance of getting enacted into law. This is actually a pretty good bill as these laws go. And, um, and I'm stepping back, I'm going on the assumption that any law that's passed is going to have to have more rights of choice, more rights of transparency maybe than we're used to, but hopefully doesn't have anything that we would call an opt-in right and doesn't and does have preemption and doesn't uh, have have you know class action uh, does, doesn't have a private right of action.